Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Um, may I ask, is the camera in your way there? Are you all right there? No. That's fine. Okay, good. Just uh, as long as you get to a, a place where the camera is not obscuring your view. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Cape Town Holocaust and Genocide Center. Very special to have you here. I see some faces of people that I don't see regularly here. You are particularly welcome. And may I just say that if you do have time this afternoon, <laughs> if you do have time this afternoon, um, there are uh, there is an opportunity for you to go into the permanent exhibition, which is open. Uh, it is open six days a week, and uh, you are most welcome to come at any time. There is no charge. Uh, we believe that it should be open to all members of the public and that it's an important institution for the city. So please do make, take advantage of that. Ladies and gentlemen, two gentlemen. One's name was Hirsch uh, Lauterbach, and the other man's name was um, Lemkin. And these two gentlemen both attended law school in a town in Ukraine called city really called Lviv now it used to be Lvov it is also known as Lemberg and it probably has one of the most prestigious uh, universities particularly the law school these two gentlemen went their own separate ways in fact they didn't think they had much contact with one another in the beginning but they certainly got to know one another as time went on because Lauterbach was the man who developed the concept in international law of crimes against humanity. Extremely important uh, concept. Both these Jewish lawyers focused on the international implications of what was happening around them. As for Lemkin, particularly, it was the Armenian genocide which prompted his thinking so many years before the Holocaust. And whilst his term genocide is now associated very closely with the Holocaust, of course it, it is the name he gave a crime that had no name and which had, of course, dominated um, certainly the 20th century and, of course, way back into history. So he coined this term out of two words, genus and cedar, one Latin, one Greek, <coughs> meaning tribe or a race, and the other one is the killing, the killing of a tribe or a race. And so the word came into our vocabulary only in the 1940s. And the crimes against humanity, too, came into our vocabulary and were part and parcel of uh, now international law at the Nuremberg trials just after the war. And that is when these, cri these crime against humanity and the concept of genocide were brought into the public domain. And they've been linked ever since. When we look at what's happening in Ukraine today, we know that there are unspeakable atrocities and human rights abuses, crimes against humanity that are being perpetrated. And it's an ongoing basis. And whilst we enter now into the second year of the war, and perhaps it recedes from public view, it certainly does not recede from the lives and times and families and all of those that are deeply affected by what is going on. And we, here in South Africa, we need to be cognizant of this thing, to know what's going on, and to try and prevail with our government through one way or another, to see it for what it is, and call it for what it is. And that's what the lecture today is going to be about. We'll examine this, these atrocities, and 
we've got this term in the title, Road to Genocide. There was no genocide, as we often say here at the center, begins with killing. That's not how genocide stopped. They start with othering, they start with creating the, those that are belong to the group and those that don't. And it's that process, which of course is often governmental, which takes over and which can lead to, indeed, as we saw in Rwanda, as we saw during the Holocaust, and we saw and seen in other things, state-sponsored killing of groups, targeted groups, with the intention to eliminate them altogether. So I think that it's important, and by the way, whether we call it genocide or we call it crimes against humanity, the suffering that takes place, there is no comparison. Suffering is suffering, as we say here at the center in many of our programs. Suffering is suffering. So we have to, above all, become vigilant and aware, and hopefully through events such as this and the publicity and you going out and spreading the word, raise awareness, and through awareness, perhaps, effect change. That's what we're hoping for. So, I, a few weeks ago, I was standing up here, I did a very different lecture, and I spotted Zenka sitting in the audience, and Zenka and I go back some years when we looked at the Holodomor and we tried to understand what that intention was, this, this, this forced constructed famine, the starvation that went on in Ukraine. And we had some very, very interesting events and worked very closely and then I retired so I didn't, wasn't here for some years and I uh, have come back now onto the board. And I saw Zrinka and we said, I said to her, hello, you know, what is happening? I feel that we should be uh, advertising what's happening. We should be spreading the word. We should be, but we're not. How, how does one do that? And so we set up a, a, a date to, cop, to, to meet and we went, actually asked, we started our date, if I can use that expression, at a um, beautiful spot in Deval Park. Anybody you, you know Deval Park? Deval Park, beautiful place, and in it there is a modest white bench. And on the sides of the bench are patterns a bit like Zvenka and our guest, Professor Aran, are wearing. Patterns that are drawn on the side of the bench, and on it is a, a memorial to uh, the suffering of those in Ukraine, in Ukraine during the Holodomor, but also more generally. And it was a beautiful way, and then we went and had coffee, and we went to coffee time, which was also very special because it was a Jewish place, and it was interesting. And we decided that we would try and find a way of connecting. And here we are today. So it's your efforts, and I want to thank you. And I would like to invite you to come and say a few words. Thanks, uh, Richard, and thanks to everybody who uh, came here today to learn more about the uh, about the Ukrainian uh, uh, war. I'm from the Ukrainian Association of uh, South Africa. It's a non-profit uh, organization that was registered in uh, 2017 to build bridges between uh, Ukraine and South Africa. And when we did a research on the Ukrainian community in South Africa, we felt even closer uh, to uh, Jewish community because uh, obviously at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, a lot of uh, people have moved to South Africa from the territory uh, that um, is Ukraine. At that time, it was Russian Empire, so when the level of settlement moved, uh, so we also write that, that a lot of people moved from the territory of Ukraine, and we also know that when people move, they bring a little bit of culture and a little bit of uh, uh, tradition to South Africa. We also always were welcome to the Ch Center of uh, Holocaust and uh, Genocide to commemorate the uh, Holodomor, as uh, Richard has um, uh, mentioned today, because uh, indeed, um, before Ukrainian independence in 1991, 
uh, this was prohibited to talk about Holodomor, uh, the man-made uh, famine that took lives of approximately of three to nine million of people in the just two years, 1932-1933. So we now can talk about that, uh, but we are also now facing even bigger challenges, the challenge of uh, Russian aggression and the war uh, that uh, has an intention of um, genocide uh, in it. It's a fight against Ukrainian identity. And uh, I also want to thank to the centers of Holocaust around the world, because what Ukraine is facing today, there is not enough of specialists to document the war crimes. And that expertise that comes from the Holocaust Center, those people who are documenting uh, and develop methodologies of documenting uh, the crimes of Holocaust are currently very, very involved in Ukraine in documenting war crimes that are happening nowadays. And we know without that expertise now we are looking at more than 29,000 of documented war crimes would not be possible if we wouldn't have those specialists. So we hope that the, uh, our organization started to celebrate Ukrainian culture. We actually started with Ukrainian festival because uh, we, our Ukrainian culture is bright uh, and we hope the food is uh, tastier and we have different musical instruments. So we think it's interesting. For today is Ukrainian uh, Easter and uh, we will teach you how to do Ukrainian painted uh, eggs. But uh, this place here we learn more and focus more about the uh, history and uh, also about the future that we hope uh, lies somewhere together for Ukraine and for South Africa. So thank you so much, uh, Richard, for having us here, and also thank you to uh, Prof. Harain for traveling from Ukraine to do this talk. Thank you, Trinka. Um, so. Um, Professor, it's my pleasure to introduce you to uh, Professor Harn, this is how you pronounce it, Alexei, who is a professor of comparative politics at the National University of Kiev in Mohila Academy since 2002. And he served as the founding director of the UKMA School for Political Analysis, and since 2015 as research director of the Democratic Initiatives Foundation, which is a leading Ukrainian analytical and sociological think tank. He's the author of multiple books, including From Brezhnev to Zelensky, that must be hot off the press, uh, Dilemmas of Ukrainian and Political Scientists in 2021, and he's co-author co editor of Constructing a Political Nation, Changes in the Attitudes of Ukrainians During the War in the Donbass. That was came out in 2017. Then Ukraine and Europe, Questions and Answers in 2009. Russia and Ukraine, 10 Years of Transformation. Moscow, published in yeah. Moscow in 2003. Moscow. Yes, yes, and which I find interesting. Yeah. And in 2014, 2015, as a political scientist, uh, Professor Hahn uh, spent several weeks at the front line near Mariupol in Luhansk. Uh, Avdivska. Avdivka? Yeah, and Donetsk Airport, which we all uh, read about very much, of course. So, having been at the front line, having come freshly from Ukraine, uh, we very much look forward to your reflections and thoughts and to leave this uh, room more educated and delightful. Thank you very much. Everybody, uh, Vitae, can you say Vitae? Vitae. From yeah. Vita, Vita, which is life, you know, Vitae in the Ukrainian, and Shalom, Shalom Aleikum. Um, Zinka mentions that today is uh, Easter. It's not only for Ukrainians, it's in general for Orthodox and Greek Catholics, for all who so called Byzantine right. So we celebrate Easter on this day. 
So congratulations to those who celebrate Easter on this day. And uh, I remember the times, because I was born and educated in the Soviet Union, when it wasn't encouraged to celebrate religious holidays. So it was possible to go to church. But if you're a member of Komsomol or a member of Communist Party, and if you are seen that you went to church for a service, you would be expelled from party and Komsomol, which will have, it doesn't mean that you will be sent to prison, but it will have consequences for, at your job, job place. People celebrated it at home, but again, not in churches. In Ukraine, under Soviet time, two Ukrainian churches were totally banned. One was called Ukraine Independent Orthodox Church, which was banned under Stalin totally. And the second one was Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. Greek Catholics is the second largest denomination in Ukraine from 6 to 10 million people. And they existed in Western Ukraine, mostly in Western Ukraine. So after Stalin seized the Western Ukraine, uh, there was huge pressure and it was announced that this church voluntarily joined Russian Orthodox Church. So that's for you to understand how Russian Orthodox Church was building, you know, uh, its force by forcefully incorporating other churches. So Greek Catholics actually, they had to go underground. And this huge church re-emerged only after well, several, later, several years after Gorbachev came to power and in independent uh, Ukraine. <coughs> so, can we just adjust the microphone? <coughs> Is it okay? Okay. Uh, usually I walk on with this piece of, uh, this piece of chalk and blackboard, but now it's more sophisticated. <laughs> Um, so, uh, what happened with Greek Catholics, actually, again, as I have said, it explains how Russian Orthodox Church was increasing its power. So, it's not surprising to see what Russian Orthodox Church and its patriarch, Kirill, are doing right now. He's blessing the war. He's blessing the war, and moreover, he is saying that those who are fighting against the Ukrainians, and who are dying will go immediately to heaven. So look, this is kind of Christian jihad, because there's no such concept in Christianity. And again, um, Russian Orthodox Church is very closely connected to the state. When the Russian Empire was officially created under Peter the First, I will not say Peter the Great, Peter the first, okay. It was in 1721. The independence of the patriarch was removed. So the, the church was, the Russian church was governed by state department. And it continued until collapse of the Russian Empire. So for more than 200 years. Which again testifies that actually Russian Orthodox Church is not an independent structure. As we, as we see it in other countries, you know, with other denominations, very integrated. It's actually integrated within, uh, with the Russian, with the Russian state. Uh, having mentioned about it, uh, religious factor and uh, Easter. Uh, now let me talk briefly uh, how we planned our lecture. Well, uh, we actually hoped that. Uh, my another colleague would be able to join us because last year the Center for Civil Liberties in Ukraine, in Kyiv, was given Nobel Peace Prize. And it was given Nobel Peace Prize for documenting the atrocities that are done in Ukraine. She is coming here, but unfortunately mm, there are problems in getting South Africa visa. So it was delayed and that's why she will come to Johannesburg and I will join you there. But, so look, I'm not 
frankly speaking, I'm not specialist you know, in genocidal issues. I am not a human rights activist and I am not a lawyer. So well, I will not um, try to give you a lot of facts, witnesses, uh, video, brutal videotapes or photos. Rather, I would try to explain to you what the reason of the war and why it pushes Russians to conduct genocidal crimes in Ukraine. And in explaining this, this road to the war, I think I'm well positioned. Why? Because, you know, I have kind of mixed origin. Ukraine, you know, Ukraine was always a place of meeting different civilizations, right? So you have Catholics in the West, Orthodox from Byzantine, you had Muslims, everything was mixed in Ukraine, and a lot of Ukrainians, they had different features. You may, you may see black people, black I mean, this color, and very dark skin, actually. You may see blonde people, so we are, we are quite different. So, uh, in my blood, three-fourths are Ukrainian, but my mother language is Russian language. How it happened? My father is from Ukrainian village, so he was speaking Ukrainian language. But then he went to Kiev, and in Kiev, the large city, there was a policy of Russification, of assimilation. So he switched to Russian language. He married my mother, who was from the city, so she was speaking Russian from the very beginning, and then I was born. So the language in my family was Russian language. But I always understood that I am Ukrainian. That's the interesting thing which I would like also to explain to you. And one fourth of my blood is from my Jewish grandmother, who came from Belarus. And she came from Belarus to Ukraine in the 20s, 1920s, when there was a so-called policy of Ukrainization, when people were, for some time, encouraged to speak Ukraine. And because she worked at the post office, she had to know Ukrainian language well. So she was the best person in my family to teach me Ukrainian language and to help me to do subjects in Ukrainian literature and Ukrainian language. So I graduated from school, I had all the excellent marks with only one subject, Ukrainian language. And I couldn't speak Ukrainian. I loved literature, I studied it, I loved Ukrainian history, but the school was Russian language school. Then I entered the main Ukrainian university in Kiev. The language of education was Russian language. Okay. But nevertheless, again, as I'm saying, it's not, you know, it's not necessary to understand that you are Ukrainian even if people are speaking Russian language. They live in Ukraine, they have the feeling of being Ukrainian. And we knew that our roots are from the village with all our Ukrainian ancestors. So that's why from my childhood they had different stories and I was very much interested in relations between Ukrainians, Russians, Jews, Belarusians. Uh, my, my grandmother told me the story of the Holocaust and all her family died in Dnipropetrovsk. So she was the only one to survive. The village of my father, as other Ukrainian villages, passed through Galadomor. And Galadomor, you know already about it, but can you imagine? Because in the Soviet Union it was denied. Then, when it was revealed, the Soviet Russian, the Soviet approach was there was no harvest. Bad year, lie. There was a huge harvest. Everything was confiscated. But in my family, my father who knew about it, he didn't tell me about it. Why? 
because they were afraid that I may go to school and I will tell something. And then there would be a punishment, consequences. So you see, it's kind of paradox. So I knew about the Holocaust. I didn't know about Ukraine and the other war. Um, the second point, but look, I believe that that time in communist ideology. I believe. Uh, look, I was dreaming about the world revolution. I was so happy when Cubans came to Angola and Cubans came to Ethiopia and they proclaimed socialist Ethiopia. I was happy, you know, world revolution is spreading. And only after, it was on the Soviet Union, and only after the archives were open and we started to discuss freely, I realized what happened next in Ethiopia. Collectivization, starvation, red terror. They used even officially, at the official level, the same term as Russian Bolsheviks. Do you know about it? So in and the Bolsheviks, there was the official term, Red Terror, after the en against the enemies of revolution. In the Ethiopia, with Soviet support, it was also declared that this is a Red Terror. And in Addis Ababa, there is a, there is a museum to the victims of Red Terror. And you see the skulls of people, you know. It's basically for the same as you see in Cambodia, of those who died. So now, yeah, now I know about, you know, this Marxist experience in the third world, and what, stand, what stood behind the good idea of world revolution. But at that time, I didn't know about that. But when it was revealed, when we had the documents, when it was possible to discuss things freely, I have realized that, look, this is not truth. It's not the case. So, and I changed my mind. Believe me, it was very, very difficult. Because my consciousness was built on that. It was my belief from use. But then it changed and, yeah, I overcome it. I overcome it as most of Ukrainians overcome. So now let's move to the reasons of this war. Why the war happened. And Mr. Putin says very explicitly that this is because of NATO. The West is bad. In the Soviet Union, I hear that the Soviet Union was besieged for this by whom? By imperialist West, Chinese Maoists, Zionists and Ukrainian bourgeois nationalists. These were four main threats to the Soviet Union. Basically now it all remains the same, with the exception of Maoists. So who are the enemies of present Russia? The West, Zionists and Ukrainian bourgeois nationalists. So let's analyze the facts. Yeah. So this is a diagram, and the red line is the attitude towards Russia and Belarus. And you see red line, that it was very, very positive all the time. It's independent Ukraine, but the attitude towards Russia was very good. Collapse, 2014. Total collapse. See? Support to NATO. Oops. Support to NATO. 2012, this is support to NATO. 12%. Very low. Most Ukrainians believed in non bloc status, which is quite natural, right? We would like to be friends with Russia, with the West. Why quarrel? But 2014, everything changed. Why? Russian aggression and annexation of Crimea. And why it was such a shock for Ukrainians? <laughs> because of violation of Budapest Memorandum of 1994. So 
South Africa in 91 denounced nuclear weapons. You had six nuclear weapons. Ukraine had the third largest nuclear arsenal in the world. Because Soviet Union collapsed and a lot of this nuclear arsenal stayed in Ukraine. So it was more than British, French, and Chinese combined together. Can you imagine it? So we, in 1994, gave it up in exchange for guarantees of our territorial integrity, which are coming from the US, the UK, and the third country is Russia. It's easy to check. Go Google Budapest Memorandum, one page. It's a very short document, so it's very, very clear. We are giving up nuclear weapons. Our territorial integrity is, is guaranteed. Moreover, Ukraine had non-block status, official non-block status. And this non-block status was supported not only by the governmental level, but also by Ukrainians. We didn't want to join it. Everything changed in 2014 when Russia attacked first Russia and next Crimea, and then Russia started war in Donbass. So Russia violated everything. When we are talking about the war, the war started not last year. The war started in 2014. That's the reality. Now we have full scale invasion. At that time, it was limited geographically. And okay, so just a minute. Okay. So it was the first annexation in Europe since World War II, the first one. Previously, annexations were made by Stalin and Hitler. Somebody may raise, you know, the issue of Kosovo or Northern Cyprus, but this is not the case of annexation. This is different. But the direct occupation of territories and saying that this is ours, so violation of all international borders and international agreements was done first by Putin. That's what making Ukrainian case unique. Because when I'm talking about our story in and our sufferings and killings in African countries, you know, sometimes I hear, look, we have it every day. We have genocides, we have starvation, we have everything. What's new? This is new. Never before the country gave up huge nuclear arsenal and its territorial integrity was violated. South Africa gave its nuclear arsenal six devices. <coughs> Fine. We have Russian aggression. It means that the international security treaties doesn't work. And it set a very bad precedent for the future. Mm -hmm. Because other countries may say, huh, we are not going to give up our nuclear weapons. Moreover, we would like to acquire nuclear weapons to defend ourselves. <coughs> so, and if we compare what was happening in Crimea, there are clear comparison to Sudetenland, to what Hitler was doing. Right? So you see now Crimean Tatars, natives of Crimea, who are against this annexation. And this is one more important point, because Russians are saying, look, this is ours, this is Russian land. When the Russians arrived to Crimea, end of 18th century, after visiting yesterday Robben Island, I know a lot about history. So it's the same like to say, okay, Dutch and British, they came here when? 8th, 18th century? This is our land. They do not take into account who lived here. 
And before that, the natives of Crimea were not Russians, even not Ukrainians, but Crimean Tatars. So this was, and Crimean Tatars, they <coughs> suffered, you see, they, they Sunni Muslim of Turkish, Turkic origin. And uh, what is important is that they also suffered huge tragedies under the Soviet regime. In 1944, the whole nation was deported from Crimea to Central Asia and Syria. During one day, the whole nation was deported by Stalin. Huge crime. And they were able to come back only since 90s. Only. Before that, if you are Crimean Tatar and you are living in somewhere in Kazakhstan, I want to come back to my motherland. So I am going, I am trying to buy a plot to build a small house. If Soviet authorities realized it, he would be immediately removed again to Central Asia. So they came only after, actually they came, it was with the independence of Ukraine. And it explains why Crimean Tatars and Ukrainians are actually together. Because they suffered. They suffered from the Soviet Union. You know, the Soviet Union was talking about internationalism, but about brotherhood of nations, but in fact, it wasn't the case. Officially, there was no anti-Semitism in Ukraine. There was huge anti-Semitism in Ukraine. I think you know about it. I can tell you a lot of stories you know, about it as well. So, uh, there is a joke that in the Soviet times, a lot of dissidents from different ethnic groups, Ukrainians, Russians, Jews, Crimean Tatars, and others, they were in Soviet camps and prisons. So there, they, start, they studied real internationalism. And that's true. And that's true, because there they were united, they were fought with a common enemy, and the common enemy was the Soviet Union, which was colonial empire. Colonial empire in a very covered way, I would say. Because officially it was brotherhood of nation. In reality, it was domination of Russian chauvinism and under communist dictatorship. So, okay, Crimea. So, NATO expansion is not the way to explain why the war happened. There was no NATO expansion to Ukraine. When Putin attacked Ukraine in 2014, there were no NATO troops, soldiers, missiles in Ukraine. When he attacked Ukraine in February last year, there were no NATO bases, missiles, soldiers, tanks in Ukraine. So why Putin? The real reason, and we need to come to history. So this is a map of medieval Europe in the year of 1000. Please have a look. It's not compound by Ukrainians, so it's from Western sources. Please have a look and let me know what was the largest state in Europe at that time. You see, that one. Maybe, you know, Holy Roman Empire may compete with it, but Holy Roman Empire too wasn't a state, it was a loose confederation. So you see the huge Kiev and Rus. Uh, and the center, the capital was Kiev. In the year of 1000, Moscow didn't exist. Kiev is at least 600 years older than Moscow. So when Russia is saying, you know, Ukraine is our, you know, Yanke Praza, come on, guys. No. He was much older than Moscow. So it was a country with a rich history and culture. But then we know history is very complicated process, right? 
So there was Mongol Tata invasion, division of this state. And at certain point, Moscow emerged, built the kingdom, and incorporated Ukraine. And then, in 1721, under Peter, uh, Peter I, the Russian Empire was proclaimed, official Russian Empire. So, an interesting story about my university, which is connected with the history of Ukraine. My university was founded in 1615, when Ukraine was part of Polish state, Rzecz Pospolita Polska. 1615. Fifty years later, the graduates of my university founded Moscow. And 80 years later, they were naive people. They helped Peter I to build the state. So, and in the Russian Empire, my university was closed down. Why? Because it was a center of being Ukrainianist, of Ukrainian culture. So my university was closed down, and it was re-emerged only in independent Ukraine. So my story, the story of my university, actually reveals the story of my country and our relations with Russia. So Russian Empire created. How did they officially call Ukraine? Who knows? Anybody? Little Russia. We were officially called Little Russia. Ukrainians were officially called... Okay. If we are Little Russia, then who we are? Little Russians. Little Russians. So again, it's easy to check. So you just go to census, to any history book of Russian Empire official document, Mala Rossi, Little Russians. <laughs> so that's, you see, the trick, because we are much older. Kiev is much older than most, but we were called Little Russians. And Ukrainian language was denied from the public use. So, Ukrainians were considered part of great Russian people. So we are just a part of great Russian people, and we speak a dialect of Russian language. Now, compare it with what Putin is saying. <coughs> he is saying, repeating it on many, many, many occasions, Russians and Ukrainians are one people. Now, can you compare it? So basically, he is coming to the ideology of the Russian Empire. It wasn't even the Soviet Union, because in the Soviet Union, in my passport, it was clearly written that I'm Ukrainian. Well, you know, to write your ethnicity in the passport is a Soviet way of doing things, and you understand why. Because it was called, I don't remember, six, six line, six graph. Number six, what is your ethnical group? And if you're a Jew, you are unlucky, because then there would be some problems in entering some uh, departments in the university. For example, lawyer's department, or department of international relations, or philosophy, there would be a huge problem. Okay? So, but it was written the time in Ukraine. It was in the Soviet Union. Putin is saying, no, Ukrainians. Great Russian people. And with the start of aggression against Ukraine, there were many articles published there, including in state-run Russian informational agencies. And one of the articles calls directly to, listen, de Ukrainianize Ukraine. De Ukrainianize Ukraine. Do you understand the meaning? No, it's difficult to understand. When we, I'm talking about it, in, for example, recently in Latin America, it was difficult for interpreter to grasp and translate, which means it would be Ukraine, but without being Ukrainian. 
And in the same article, there was a call to divide Ukraine into many quasi-states with no name Ukraine in the title. Now tell me, is it the ideological base for genocide? I would say yes. There's no doubt about it. So we are going to conquer this land, which is called Ukraine, to deprive it of its name, to deprive the sense of being Ukrainian. That's the idea. That's the basic for what Russians are doing right now in Ukraine. And we need to understand, well, sometimes, you know, Russian propaganda, propagandists who are in the West, they are saying, oh, this was written just one author in one article. No, come on. This is state-run agency. Russia is dictatorship, full stop. Everything which is published there is controlled from the above. It's not like here or under democracy. We know that everybody can publish basically everything. It's very, very controlled and tight system. So, my point is, yes, this is ideological background for genocide, and it explains, you hear the story about Bucha, not far from Kiev, where there are mass graves with 7,600 Buddhists, for example. Uh, thousands from Kherson who, who disappeared, who disappeared, nobody knows where are they. Uh, Ukraine officially has the list of 20,000 Ukrainian children who are deported to Russia. This is official. But look, you know, Russians are doing sometimes things they do not try even to conceal. So I have a quote from Russian officials who was talking about hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian children deported to Russia. They do not conceal it. So, <clears throat> that's why it's very important to have here the support of international community to investigate all, this, all these crimes and to call those who are responsible to the trial. That's important. Very important. Now, let me come to um, the question, which is also very important. Um, it's, it, what does it mean to be Ukrainian? Putin is saying that he is fighting Nazi in Ukraine. Well, that's interesting. You know, we have a Jew who is a president. Actually, he was Russian-speaking before election, he wouldn't speak Ukrainian language well. Uh, in the year of 2019, we were the only country in the world, besides Israel, who had Jewish presidents and prime minister. It coincided, both our president and prime minister, they were Jews. Nevertheless, Putin is talking about Nazi, and I believe it was Lavrov who said, look, these Nazis, these Ukrainian Nazis, they are even worse than German Nazis. Why? Because German Nazis, they were open in their policy and ideology. And here it is concealed under the guise of being democratic state and so on and so forth. Can you imagine? But do you know this notorious statement? Who said that? Lavrov, I believe. Not Putin, Lavrov. That uh, Jews are also responsible for the crime of Hitler because Hitler had some Jewish blood. You know about it. It's crazy. But Russians are doing it. Now, we should put, because I hear it sometimes from, uh, in different sources, that, well, there are Nazis in Ukraine. Look, guys, what does it mean to be Nazi? Nazi is extermination of other people and nation. What we have in Ukraine is totally different. Not because we are Ukrainians, such a wonderful you know, people. We are wonderful people, definitely. But because the notion of nation is not based on ethnicity. It's political nation. 
its contemporary understanding of uh, political nation. And political nation means that it can encompasses different ethnic, ethnic groups, different denom religious denominations, different language groups. The only thing what is important is that I love this country and I would like to support this country and to defend it in case if it's important. And that's what Putin never understood. Because he was thinking, oh, there are many Russian speakers in Ukraine because of the centuries of Russification. Basically, you know, most Ukrainians are bilingual, so we know both languages. So Putin was, Putin hoped that Russian soldiers would be met with flowers. They were met with the guns and bullets. Let me show you some pictures. This is famous Ukrainian Maidan, a peaceful manifestation against the guy who wanted to become a dictator in Ukraine, whose name was Yanukovych, but it doesn't matter. It's not so important what was his name, okay? But people, you know, rallied in a peaceful protest. Uh, this is, by the way, this is my daughter. She was at school at that time, you know, so people are coming for blessing in my time. Because Putin also, he was saying, this is Nazi movement, Nazi movement. No. This is famous pine tree, because it was on the eve of, uh, eve of the New Year. So you see the different, different flags of different countries in the center of Maidan. Okay, so you see Canada, you see, I don't know what that is, Italy, European Union. There were Israeli flags as well, many others. But look, I will show you something. So, look, this is Ukrainian flag, right? Blue and yellow. This is a flag of Ukrainian nationalists during World War II. We may talk about it if there are some questions. But look, what is, it, what is in, in between? This is Russian flag. How could it appear? Between the flags of Ukraine and Ukrainian nationalists. The answer is that many Russians who lived in Ukraine and some Russians who are fleeing from Russia, from dictatorship in Russia to Ukraine, they hoped that this Maidan would liberate them as well. And it would be a model for Russia to transform itself. Do you understand what I mean? So Ukraine will be democratic, and it will be example for Russia, for Russian people, that it's possible to be democratic. And this is, by the way, one more reason why Putin attacked Ukraine? Because he was afraid of this example to his own, to his own people. So actually, so Russians in Maidan, uh, okay, this guy is very interesting. I made this photo on the front line. So this is a photo of uh, voluntary battalion which was called right sector, and this right sector is depicted in Russia as very nationalist. So this guy, I made the photo. Here it's not seen very well, but this is uh, Kalashnikov. So he's not actually here. So I asked him, what is your name? And you know that at the front line, people do not use names, they use nicknames. So, and he said, Moses. I said, why Moses? And he said, first of all, because I am a Jew. First, because I am preaching. I am teaching others to preach. And this was very, I think, he is from Dnipropetrovsk. So, South Ukraine, quite russified at that time. So, but this is very interesting. So, he took the guns to defend Ukraine. And that's why I am saying that Putin did incredible things. Nobody else in the world could unite Jews and Muslims. And it's done in Ukraine. Because they are fighting with Putin. But that's true. 
that's true. Uh, okay, so this is interesting for I am Afro American. Oh, Afro Ukrainian. Because this is Ukrainian MP, very famous one. He's Olympic champion. His father is from Rwanda, and actually his father died during genocide in Rwanda. But he is Ukrainian MP. Okay, so this is also example of Ukrainian political nation. And just, you know, occasional photo. So I met this guy, occasional, in subway. And you see, he is in the same Ukrainian Russian <laughs> as me. You know, it's not stage photo. I met him, you know, waiting for, for the train. So he, he is from Congo, he graduated in Ukraine, he stayed there. So um, you see how he feels? He speaks wonderful Ukrainian language. Okay, so this is about the importance of being Ukrainian, importance of political nation in Ukraine. And that's why we are strong. Again, because it's not based on ethnic nationalism. Russian policy is based on ethnic nationalism. It's based to a great extent on Christian fundamentalism. They also um, are staging uh, war between Prazis Muslims because they look what Russians are doing. Again, by saying Russians, I mean official Russian. Because in Ukraine, we are fine with Russians who are living in Ukraine. That's most important to understand. Russians who are living in Ukraine, they know Ukrainian language. They consider Ukraine to be the motherland. It's fine. There are some differences, but basically it's, it's okay. Russians who are living in Russia, they do not understand what is Ukraine. So it's not only a problem of Putin. It's a problem of Russian elite, not only present, but all Russian elite. They never understood Ukraine. They considered Ukraine to be artificial state. Ukraine was created by Austria-Hungary. Ukraine was created by Poland. Now Ukraine is created by the Holy West and all these things. So, so you see that 90% of Ukrainians, and this poll is made during the war, are proud of being Ukraine. That's the way Putin never understood. But not only Putin, as I have said. What about common Russians? Are common Russians guilty for what's going on or not? This is a very difficult question to answer. And again, I will give you my personal example. A lot of Ukrainians have relatives in Russia. I have cousins. And two weeks since the start of the war, he didn't call me. You know, I started to, maybe something, maybe he doesn't feel good. So I called him, and I asked him, Sasha, do you know that we are bombarded? And he said to me, do you know, uh, who is bombarding you? He didn't believe me. Then he called my mother. My mother told him the same. Look, the problem is that even if we have relatives who are living in Russia, a lot of them, not all, because people are different, so it's very difficult to generalize, but a lot of them follow the Russian propaganda, this trap. They are whitewashed. But I would say that Russian society has their own responsibility for that as well. They are ill. They are electing Putin. We know, with falsifications. But he is getting the majority. Not in Moscow and St. Petersburg. That's interesting. That the highest percentage of votes for Putin is coming from Chechnya or from some other regions which are underdeveloped. Because it's manipulated, it's falsificated. In Moscow and St. Petersburg, uh, Russians are more in opposition to Putin. But in general, yes, he is supported by Russians. And look, in the, I, I told you that in the Soviet Union, I believe in communism. 
But I also had doubts, but it was very difficult to check. In Soviet camps and prisons, I turned off the radio. Because, you know, it, all my psychology immediately, you know, went upside down. And so now in Russia, they do not want to think. They do not want. It's more comfortable to believe that Putin is good, that there are bad people around Russia, that, yes, we, it's necessary to punish Ukrainians for what? That we want to elect our own president, that we are democracy. I was uh, criticizing Zelensky a lot. I'm not his fan. But it's for us, for Ukrainians, to decide who will be our president, not for Putin. If people would like to elect him, okay, this is a democracy. So now maybe just final words, final words about what can be done and what is to be done. We are asking for support. We are asking for support in any, in any form. Uh, you know, sometimes we hear in Africa that it's not our war. Look, energy prices, fertilizers, shortage of food. This is a result, to a great extent, this is a result of the war. Grain corridors from Ukraine, Russia is trying to block. There are some successes here, but it's not stable. Russians are occupying nuclear power stations in Zaporizhia. Do you know any examples in history where nuclear power station was occupied by foreign military? Any example? No. Putin did it for the first time in the history of mankind. And this nuclear power station is the largest in Europe. So Chernobyl compared to it is a child. What Russian soldiers are doing? So, what I'm trying to tell here is that for us, for Ukrainians, the end of the war is Russian soldiers are going out of Ukraine. This is our own aim. Get out of Ukraine. Full stop. We, don't, we are not going to invade Russia. We are not going to bombard Moscow and St. Petersburg. This is not our aim. So, this is our main aim. And we know that most countries in the world are supporting it. So this is one of the UN votes when Russia conducted so-called sham referendums in the occupied areas. So this was the resolution on territorial integrity of Ukraine. 143 countries supported Ukraine. Four countries sided with Russia. You see these countries. Syria, Belarus, Nicaragua, and North Korea. In some others, in some other votes, you know, Eritrea and Mali are also supporting Russia. Look, but what about Africa? Africa is almost divided. So half of African countries are supporting territorial integrity of Ukraine, and half of African countries, including South Africa, abstain. Again, I am not here to teach you or your government what to do. But just think. So that's what I don't understand. Why? We gave up nuclear weapons. We were a non block country. We are attacked by the guarantor of our territorial integrity. The former colonial empire is trying to come back. Why don't you support it? I mean us. Why don't you support us? Why do you abstain, you, the country which suffered from colonialism for centuries? So it means that Russian propaganda is very strong. Russian ties are quite strong. You know, Russia is using disinformation, corruption, all these things, you know. So that's why, you know, everything would be helpful for Ukraine, including diplomatic support. You know, and when we hear from Russia, oh, the global south is not supporting Ukraine. No, this is not the case. Look, Brazil, Argentina, half of Africa, Indonesia, 
very important countries, they are supporting Ukraine. Unfortunately, territorial integrity of Ukraine. Unfortunately, we see that China, India, we may discuss it. South Africa are abstaining. So, also, economic support. Again, we understand that for countries which are facing serious economic problems, it's difficult, you know, to cut ties with Mm. With some economy. By the way, Russia, Russian, South African bilateral trade is not the largest. No. But we understand. But at least try to diversify. Try, try not to depend on Russian gas as it was in Europe, or on Russian nuclear uh, facilities, or whatever. And just before this talk, I had this possibility to visit your museum and it reminded me, look, that when the Holocaust was in full sway in Europe, some countries continue to trade with Hitler. Right? And this story of uh, this uh, ship, St. Louis, right? Yeah. So we have these examples. Yes, we understand it's difficult to cut off ties, but think that every dollar, every penny, every rent which is spent to Putin will be used for the war. With uh, the Parisian nuclear power station, again, as I have said, we have this global, not global, but the main aim that Russians are leaving the territory of Ukraine. But even before this, something important could be done. For example, Russian soldiers are leaving the Parisian nuclear power station. Okay, it could be not, not Ukrainian troops, okay, but international peacekeepers or uh, international experts who are coming to the station and who are controlling the station. Because if anything happens, it would have huge consequences, not only for the region, for the whole world, because it would be radioactive contamination of grain. And definitely it's important to urge Russia to stick to the rules of the war and Geneva Convention. It's violated by Russia. And Putin is a problem is Putin. Well, actually the war is a problem, aggressive war is a problem in itself. But Putin is for Putin the war is the war not with the Ukrainian army. It's a war against Ukrainian civilians. And Ukrainians are dying every day. So, I will stop here. I am optimist. Because, strangely enough, but Ukrainians are optimists. 92% believe in Ukrainian victory. 92%. And Ukrainians won't restore our territorial integrity. So when somebody is talking, well, we understand that you are right, but it's necessary to have a compromise to Putin, give him something. Ukrainians doesn't want to do that. No, it's a bad, it's appeasement policy. It's what happened with Austria, with Czechoslovakia, with Poland. So whenever you have appeasement of aggressor, he will move. He will move first. So again, it's not President Zelensky and it's not President Biden who are telling Ukrainians, you need to fight. That's we, Ukrainians, we are fighting. And by the way, this fight is everywhere. Yesterday I watched the work of Ukrainian Association of South Africa. And this is extremely important. Because these people, this is volunteer. They are volunteers, right? There are volunteers in Ukraine. There are volunteers here who are spending their time, money, resources to support Ukraine. So thank you very much. Attending this lecture is your contribution to understanding Ukraine, to understanding what's going on in Ukraine. So thank you very much. Thank you. Totaraba. Sure. Look, yeah, I will take some questions.
the death of her. What I will ask you, I am here, I came a long way. So I am here to talk to you about everything what you would like to hear. You may put the difficult questions, you may raise provocative topics. I'm ready to discuss, let's do that. But I will take my pen to box, pardon. Right, uh, who would like to begin? Um, I'm sure that there are many questions that have emerged from your very passionate and informative talk, Professor. Yeah. It, was, I, it, it, was, it, was, it was a passionate talk, it was but a, it's based on hard facts. I know, I know that. And I, I know am that, academic. And, and I cannot, and you know, but I cannot believe that anybody who comes out of uh, that country can feel anything but passionate. And it would be, um, whilst you are an academic and you have given us a very, very clear picture of the uh, history and how it has all come to where we are today, which of course is not from yesterday, not from last year. It's a long history. Um, I think uh, that your passion helps us to understand the crucial uh, involvement that we need to have, all of us, at least in our knowledge and at least in our acceptance of listening to facts and to trying to uh, really work out for ourselves uh, what is happening and where in our own way we can make some kind of contribution as I believe just holding this lecture today is part of that process. Exactly. Is part of that process. So, ladies and gentlemen, anything you would like to ask? I, I would like to, if, if, while people are thinking, sometimes it takes one question. Uh, you asked for hard questions. Yes. Um, the, the issue of the actual, if we take the portrait of the Russian soldier who has been coming in and who is responsible for the kind of atrocities that we've been reading about, the mass graves, the, the, the rape, the, and so on. And at the same time, you hear of Russian soldiers who are deserting, who are not wanting to be part of this. How is it that those two sides exist alongside of one another in uh, what you understand is a nationalistic, propagandized force uh, in terms of the Russian army uh, undertaking this war? How would you, how would you see that um, those two existing alongside of one another? Well, it's, it's not a surprise, you know, it's during every war, during every conflict, there are different people with different views and approaches, different characters. Um, so I would say if we are talking about, about Russian society in general, so we could divide it schematically, very schematically, into three parts. One which is, fu which is fully full, by Putin's propaganda, you know. Uh, the smallest part, Russians who are critical towards Putin's regime, who understand things are going wrong. By the way, I would, I would like to stress, what Putin is doing is against Russian national interests. Why? Before 2014, Russia was a legitimate player it was a member of G8, right? G8, you know, billion deals, multi-billion deals, trade. So Russians had everything. Now, the trend towards isolation of Russia. So basically, I believe what Putin is doing is not for greatness of Russia. It's vice versa. But most Russians believe him. Smallest part, as I have said, they understand. This leads to, to catastrophe. Some of these people emigrated. Some of these people are within Russia, but they are silent. Because if you say that this is a war in Ukraine, the war, what will happen to you? You will go to prison. Because from official point of view, it's called special military operation. So you cannot call the war a war. You will go to prison. Okay, so they are silent. And finally, the third part, you know, people who 
don't believe anybody, they may don't believe Putin, but they are not against Putin, so they just don't want to die in Ukraine. And that's why, you know, they're trying to get out of Russia in order not to die. Thank you, Professor, for a very interesting talk. Uh, I've heard people say that if Ukraine were prepared to guarantee that they would not join NATO, it may be easier to form some kind of a negotiation with the, uh, Russia about leaving the country, hopefully Crimea as well. I, I, I haven't got the facts where I must be prepared to give up. But it may be a start to negotiation. What is your feeling about uh, them as an independent democracy being prepared to guarantee that they will not join NATO in the foreseeable future? Okay, so what should we promise Putin not to join NATO? Yes. Okay. Good question. But that's what we did. That's what we did. As I'm saying, before 2014, we didn't want to join NATO. We were a non-bloc country. And Putin attacked. So how can we believe him? That's a problem. It didn't work. That's a problem. Again, Ukrainians believed in that. I was saying all the time that we should join NATO, but I was among this minority of 12% Ukrainians before 2014. Most, most people said, no, we should be non bloc. And Putin attacked. So it doesn't work. That's a problem. So look, theoretically, now, let's, let's put it pragmatically. Now, we understand at this point that uh, NATO would not embrace us during the war for obvious reasons, right? The question is, what will happen after the war, okay? Can we trust Putin or somebody else in Russia after the war, after what has happened? That's the problem. And that's the explanation why all the neighbors of Russia join NATO. Why Putin is not attacking Estonia? 40% are Russian speakers and the population is too many. From military point of view, it's to seize the country. Why? Because Estonia is a NATO member. Why Putin attacked Ukraine? Because we didn't have security umbrella. Now, the answer to your question is what Sweden and Finland did after Putin's invasion, right? They were neutral for, for the case, for centuries, right? And what they did, they decided to join it. Because they understand it's not possible to trust, to trust Russia, to trust the dictatorship in Russia. That's a problem. It won't be stable. And every, every agreement which was signed by Russia with Ukraine, you know, it was violated, and Russia was moving step by step. You know, first Crimea, then Donbass, then Azov Sea, then attack against the whole Ukraine. So if we agree now that, for example, part of territory will remain under Russian occupation, Russia will regroup itself. If we will not have security guarantees, Russia will regroup and attack again. Because they have this aim to destroy Ukraine as a state. Once uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski said, uh, he was national security advisor to, to President Carter, and he said that with Ukraine, Russia will reemerge as empire. Without Ukraine, Russia has a chance to become a democratic state. Your question, and then one more question. I, I'm sorry again. Yeah. Your question is very, very logical, right? But we tried it already, and it was violated. So, 
was thinking about, so Ukraine before the full-scale invasion didn't really have much of a, an image in, in Africa. And so it must be a challenge to, while fighting off the invasion, find ways to, to reach out, appeal to, to people in countries which are deeply skeptical of the West, swallow Russian propaganda, and in many cases have a very weak or non-existent democratic state with bearing in mind that the Russian Federation is always good friends with very bad people from Syria to yeah. Uganda. And of course we had some issues here with uh, the potential Russian nuclear power plant which would have <coughs> bankrupted us for decades. So the question is, what is Ukraine doing to try and develop soft power amongst uh, potentially skeptical African nations? Very good question. The short answer is we have the word of truth. That's the most important. We don't have resources like Russia have. We, we are not able you know, to compete with Russian resources and corrupt money and schemes. But we have the word of truth. And if I may refer to Bible, during Orthodox Easter. So it's like, uh, but actually it's common Bible for all of us, for Jews include for Hebrews, because it's the story of David and Goliath. Small David against Goliath, who won, we know. So uh, regarding your question, very good question, very tough question, because Yes, before this uh, invasion, I would say Ukraine wasn't so active in Africa. That's true. Why? Again, from logical point of view, because after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the main vectors of Ukrainian policy were Russia and former post-Soviet Union countries and Europe and the West. That's understandable. So the main vector. So the other vectors were, to some extent, underestimated. But even if we are talking about it, you know, Ukraine was active, for example, in peacekeeping. Okay, and we were in uh, at least on ten missions in ten countries with very huge uh, peacekeepers, peacekeeping missions in uh, in Sierra Leone, more than five hundred. In I just checked yesterday. In Liberia, 300, in Angola, more than 200, and so on and so forth. And by the way, for me, it was a surprise that our peacekeeping, our peacekeepers were uh, not evacuated, how to say it, were withdrawn from the DRC only in September last year. Only in September. So, which means after the Russian aggression in 2014. Ukrainian peacekeepers continued to perform their mission in many African countries. And even, you know, after this full-scale invasion until, uh, until September. So we had to withdraw. But when we are talking about, again, about the arguments, I think we have a lot of arguments. Nothing should be invented, you know, just, just uh, let's think about, so, we, I think we have a lot of common because this is a, this is uh, an example when we were under colonial empire for more than 300 years, even more. Yeah, 350 years we were in colonial empire and we got independence, which was very difficult, but uh, now, former colonial empire is coming back, so we may talk about it. We may remind about Ukrainian support to African countries. It was interesting for me to realize, you know, in the time of apartheid, there was a United Nations Special Committee on apartheid. And so from the so-called socialist bloc, there were two countries who were in this special committee, Hungary and Ukraine. You know, Ukraine at that time existed in the form of Ukrainian Soviet Republic, but nevertheless, 
more than 300, uh, how to put it correctly, activists of ANC were trained in, in Ukraine, near Odessa, at the beginning of the 60s. And so many students, you know, who were from uh, Ukraine, uh, 10,000 Nigerian students who were in Ukraine on the eve of this aggression. So we contributed quite a lot. Many Ukrainian engineers worked here in in Africa. And by the way, uh, there are very, very interesting parallels, some parallels, even with South Africa. Everybody knows about Nelson Mandela. Let me tell you one, and yesterday I went to Robben Island. Let me tell you one very interesting thing, which we Ukrainians didn't know when we lived in the Soviet Union. Uh, in the Soviet Union, from the former point of view, every republic has a right to secede. So it was written in the Constitution. You can secede if you want. So there was a Ukrainian lawyer whose name was Lukyanenko who said, okay, I'm going to promote it. What happened to him? He was sentenced to death in 1961. And then he spent in prison and camps 27 years. Mm. And he participated in national liberation <coughs> movement in eight, at the end of the 80s. And he said an interesting, po he made an interesting point. He said that those Ukrainian communists who would like to reach independence of Ukraine are our allies. So we are ready to work together to get the independence of Ukraine non-violent. Does it resemble mm -hmm. anybody? <laughs> yes. But you know, people in the world, they don't not have, know about it. But we had it. And there was also a, a, a huge evolution. When we are talking about Ukrainian national, national liberation movement during World War II, it was violent. But then it was reassessed totally reassessed. So all national liberation <coughs> movement in Ukraine since the end of 50s was non-violent. All the movement of Crimean Tatars, who are Muslims, and Russians are talking, you know, they're fundamentalists, jihadists, no lie. It was for decades non-violent movement. Yeah. Last, uh, last question. Why last? This one and then you. So, and then you will Thank you, very much. Thank you again for a talk which was both rational and based on fact. But may I suggest that we're talking about politics, and yeah. politics is about power, right. not rationality or fact. And we are dealing not only with Putin, we have people like Trump, yeah. we have people here in South Africa, we have Netanyahu in Israel. It's not about rationality, unfortunately, and I don't quite know how one actually does deal the situation like that. So as informed as your talk is, it's what the power play is going to work out that might, in fact, tell us what will be happening. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry, <coughs> that's... Uh, it's a comment rather than a question. Yeah, it's common, but look, uh, we continue to do what we want. That's the answer. You know, you know, uh, look, since uh, since the Soviet Union, again, I remind my past in the Soviet Union, we were told that the EU is collapsing and NATO is collapsing. Okay, so I heard it in the 60s. You know, it survived. There are huge threats to democracy. First of all, because we live in the new age, the age of populism, of social media, so huge threats, huge threats. But nevertheless, we still see that democracy is functional. So. Imagine the worst case situation, Trump is re-elected. Well, Trump is not alone. No, Trump was a president. Now I'm reading Ukrainian translation of his book. I'm to write a review of it by McMaster. So, oh, it's not here, but anyway, now it's here, okay? So. So I am read a book of General McMaster, who was national security advisor to Trump. And he's writing about these years. So you know, Trump was very popular. So there are forces which are balancing him, right? 
So, but in, in, so imagine Trump is is elected again. Well, it would be tough, not easy, but we will continue to do what we can do. We put a provocative question in our poll: What would you do if the Western support stops to arrive? Would you agree to sign an agreement with Putin and give some territories to him? And the answer of Ukrainians, the first, number one, more than, it was about 60%, that we will continue to fight. The second option was, okay, we will freeze the conflict, but we will not sign an agreement that, we, that our territories are ceded to. To Russia. So basically, we continue to do what we can do. <laughs> Look, because today is Easter, after the Second World War, the Ukrainian liberation movement crashed. The leaders of the Ukrainian liberation movement who emigrated to the West were killed, poisoned, blown up in terrorist attacks organized by the Soviet Union. All the territory of Ukraine is tightly controlled by KGB assimilation in full sway. So Ukrainians in diaspora, they had uh, the following saying, the Christ has resurrected, Ukraine will resurrect. And it happened, you know. Nobody could predict, uh, I mean mainstream, political scientists, mainstream, they couldn't predict the dissolution of the Soviet Union. It happened. So, again, we need to continue to do our work. That's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. My name is Mujia Mangangura Job. I'm from Rwanda. Rwanda? Yes. Um, my question is... Yes, I'm so sorry. My English is, is not well, but... I My try. English is not so well, you know. <laughs> I'm yeah, not I when, when I come here, I don't talk anything. I always talk like Chinese. <laughs> yeah. My question is, uh, you said uh, Russia, they killing civilian in Ukraine. And every time when I watch in the TV, I like to watch uh, the news from Ukraine and Russia, that war. Uh, America and Europe, they like to support Ukraine. Money and gun, tank, and um, aeroplane for me to, to, to go to fighting Russia. And but I didn't, I didn't see that Europe or uh, on UN, UN peacekeeping to go to support that, that civilian. Why? In Ukraine? Why, yes. Okay. Why, why, why they, they support Ukraine money and gun to go to fighting Russia? Why they don't, they don't help to fight to go to support civilian? That second question. Okay. Uh, uh, that's the uh, first question. Uh, excuse me, let, let me double check. So, yeah. who the 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 Ah, okay. The, okay. Yeah, and the second? Yes. And uh, I, you said again, uh, South Africa and Africa, many Africa, Asia, they they support uh, Russia. They don't support Ukraine. No, they don't support Russia. They yes, stay. They, yes, mm -hmm. yeah. I think the problem in Africa uh, is colonialism. Yeah. Uh, that colonialism, Europe when they they going to the uh, to support uh, Ukraine. Sometimes the Africa they wake up because uh, Russia they don't do any colonialism in Africa. Okay. I remember 1994 in my in my country I was lost all of my family and they was putting me in the cross like Jesus. You can see my hand. 
and food after they killed my, my family. And that, that time, UN was in my country. They never support anybody. And uh, Belgium also, uh, is, it was involved for genocide in my country. They never support, they was put in the military, in the aeroplane, and they leave all of my family, they was, they was killing one million people. Yes, I thank uh, my president, uh, Paul Kagame, because he was trying to, to fight, to, to stop that genocide. And my country was died, was died. Now when you see my country, it's very good country in Africa and everywhere. And I want to ask why every time in Africa, when they get problem, why the, the, there is Europe is not come to help Africa, and when, when the, 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 the white or other craft from white, when they get problem in Europe and America, they wake up. That is my question. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm really sorry about the tragedy of your family. We know about Rwanda. Uh, yeah. We were discussing what happened in Rwanda during my classes, so we are aware of that. Regarding your first question, UN peacekeepers. Well, Ukraine suggested since Russian aggression began in 2014 in Ukraine, was ready to invite peacekeepers for Donbass, UN peacekeepers. It was blocked by Russia, full stop. So we were ready to do that because Russia has veto power. Regarding your second question, which is more complicated, yes, I know that uh, in Africa and some other countries of the world, uh, again, I would say that they are not supporting Russia openly, but they are trying, you know, to continue relations with Russia to stay neutral. Uh, so many countries, as you see, many countries, as you see on the map, they support the territorial integrity of Ukraine. Uh, look, but the, some countries. Some people in the global south, they would like to frame this war in Ukraine like a conflict between NATO and Russia, like the Cold War. It's not a Cold War. The Cold War ended. Again, I was trying to present you hard facts that NATO wasn't involved in. Uh, when Russian invasion started, we were asking we understood that NATO is not going to fight for us because we are not a NATO member. And you are saying that in Europe, NATO is ready to support, to fight, because most of European countries are NATO countries. So they have this security, security treaty. So uh, when Russian aggression started, we asked NATO to close skies. NATO said no. We asked to supply, to give us uh, and the aircraft system, uh, tanks, jets. No. Why? They were afraid to provoke Russia. So only now we started to receive uh, patriots, American patriots, tanks. And there is a discussion now about jets a year later. Having so, so the West was very tried not to be provocative to Russia. Having said that, we appreciate the position of those who are helping Ukraine. And first of all, European countries, United States, Canada, <coughs> Japan, Australia, and other, but also some African countries. For example, Morocco decided to resupply Soviet type tanks to Ukraine. Yes. So this is also. Uh, regarding peacekeeping missions, the problem of peacekeepers. So, you know that the mission of peacekeepers is actually limited. And uh, the uh, uh, decision on peacekeepers 
is again is done within the UN Security Council if we are talking about UN peacekeepers. Because for example in Mali I know there were or some other countries there were French peacekeepers which were not part of uh, UN structures. But in the UN it depends also on uh, again on, on Russia as well. So in many cases it's difficult to 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 have a decision. And we need to understand that peacekeepers are not all powerful. If there are no, well, a lot depends on institutions within the country. You know, if there is a no, if there is no national unity or no enough support, you may have incredible international aid, and it doesn't help. In the case of Afghanistan, right? Huge support from international community. And it failed. Actually, right after peaceful agreement was signed, because Taliban immediately violated, but there was no reaction. So, and Afghan army collapsed, and Afghan president left the country. When Putin saw it, he thought, the West is weak, I will strike, there would be no reaction from the West, President Zelensky would leave the country, and it didn't happen. Why? Because of Biden? Because of Zelensky? I should give Zelensky a credit, he stayed. But I can't imagine any Ukrainian leader who would leave the country. Why? Because Ukrainians are fighting. Because people were not waiting for orders to take the arms. So, well, your question, well, um, the narrative of the West against, colonial West against non-colonial Russia is not correct. As I have said, Russia is direct and uh, direct success of the Soviet Union. Soviet Union was colonial empire. I tried to give you some examples in Africa where Soviet Union tried to install to install Marxist regimes which were dependent on the Soviet Union. And you faced huge civil wars in Mozambique, in Angola, in Chad, and in other, in Ethiopia and in other countries. Um, but, I lost what I wanted to say. Okay, so this is important to remember. Regarding peacekeepers, okay, not everything can be done with peacekeepers. I, yes, I know, we know the responsibility. There are other examples, for example, in Bosnia and Srebrenica, when Dutch peacekeepers actually left, and it opens the way to mass killings in this city. But a lot depends also on domestic situation in the country. You cannot impose institutions if they do not exist, if there is no domestic support within the country. So Afghanistan showed it very well, you know. But by the way, do you know who invaded Afghanistan? Who started the war in Afghanistan? What country? You know? Russia. Soviet Union. Yeah. There was neutral, peaceful Afghanistan with wonderful relations with the Soviet Union. No, they wanted to impose socialism in Afghanistan. It lost. Nobody supported socialism. Then, the West came and they wanted to establish democracy. It doesn't work. Unfortunately, no institutions which are working. This is a uh, year. So, you know, export of revolution in the same way as export of democracies doesn't work if there are no conditions, domestic conditions for that. And this is, by the way, a typical Marxist approach, I'm sorry. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I'm ready to talk. You know? We are, um, we are. The hour is late, and we uh, have to actually get out of the building by five o'clock. So I have to bring it to an end. Uh, it's clear that there is much to discuss and much to learn. And Professor Aaron, you've actually given us an incredible overview, and I know that the there is uh, in the room uh, a lot more question, and uh, maybe. We can sneak a cup of tea outside, but um, we can't actually continue with the meeting, unfortunately. So I uh, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for your talk. Thank you for giving us such an excellent overview. And we really appreciate the time that you've spent with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
thank you. A small uh, token of appreciation, which much. is the history of the Cape Town Holocaust and Genocide Centre. Um, but we really uh, do appreciate this talk, yeah. and it's, it's important to us. So thank you very much again. Unfortunately, right after this lecture, I go to the airport to go to Johannesburg. But look, both myself and the centers and universities, which are working in Kiev, we have very active Jewish community, we have Jewish studies at my university, we have different Jewish centers, so if you're interested to cooperate, to have some exchanges, online, whatever, so we are open. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Gentlemen, um, please do help yourself to some biscuits and things, uh, courtesy of the uh, uh, of the Ukrainian Association in South Africa. Thank you very much.